we want to encourage you, as was announced, we have our summer series continuing this Wednesday night. Brother Larry DeLong from the Edgewood Congregation. When we have our theme, our glorious God and his amazing attributes, we're looking this Wednesday night at our God and his wrath, his anger. Very needed study, very interesting study, so we would encourage everyone be with us Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Well, we're looking at Bible treasures, things of eternal value. And remember, when we began this series, we said, in essence, this series, these lessons will confront and challenge this old world's crazy, mixed-up value system. And that's exactly what we have in our society. In Isaiah 27 and verse 11, God says concerning his people, they are not a people of discernment. Well, we live in the midst of a people that are not discerning. Remember in Matthew 7 and verse 6, Jesus said, Don't cast your pearl before the swine. It was for the same reason, the swine, the pigs, they have no spiritual discernment. They have no spiritual refinement. And so that pearl looks just like to them a rock. Not a people of discernment. That's why back in Isaiah, Isaiah 29 and verse 16, Isaiah says, my, how you turn things around. And remember how much they turn things around. Isaiah 5 and verse 20, they were calling what was evil good and what was good evil. And so today, again, we live in a society that lacks discernment. We turn things in this society around. We call what is worthless precious and what is precious worthless. You remember in Luke 16 and verse 15, that which is highly esteemed in the sight of men is an abomination before God. And so many times what we hold precious and valuable, it isn't worth anything in God's sight. We are taught in Philippians 1 and verse 10 to set our approval on things that are excellent. And so I think this series helps us do just that. We've looked at Bible treasures, things of eternal value, the soul of man, its value, the kingdom, the church, its value, marriage and the family, its surpassing value, the word of God, its worth, and last Sunday night, buried talents. Remember what we said from Matthew 25? Buried talents should be viewed as buried treasures. And each and every one of us need to recognize our abilities. We need to dig them up so that not one talent is wasted in the Lord's service. Well, tonight, you can forget about the world's value system. I believe what we're looking at tonight challenges our value system. It challenges my value system. It challenges your value system. It makes us think about things deeply. And so what I want us to do tonight, here's what we're looking at. This X marks the spot. What treasure is it that we're looking at tonight? A unique one. I'm thankful it's in the Bible or we would have never put it in this study. Think about this. Here's the treasure that we're looking at, the reproach of Christ. Go with me again to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. We're going to be reading verses 24 through 26, and we're going to notice Moses' value system. We're going to see what he viewed as important, as valuable. And again, what we're going to see, he considered the reproaches of Christ to be greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. Do you have that same concept? Do I have that same concept? That the reproaches of Christ, they're worth more than all the treasures in this world. Well, look at this. Hebrews 11, verses 24 through 26, 
By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Stop here for just a moment. When he became of age, this decision was not a childish decision. This decision was one made of age. It was a mature decision. And once again, what was the decision he made? He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Look at verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Notice what this decision involved. He renounces his claim to the throne. He's not going to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing what? Rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So think about that choice. Think about that decision. He chose to suffer rather than to enjoy. We don't live in the midst of people today that make that kind of choice. If they have to choose between suffering and enjoyment, even though the enjoyment involves sin, they're going to choose enjoyment every time. So he made an educated decision. He made a very mature decision, a choice. What was it? I won't be called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. I'm going to rather suffer than to enjoy. Now, why did he do this? Well, look at verse 26. It says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Moses, how could you do that? How could you, since you have the opportunity to be known as the Pharaoh's daughter's son, how could you give all of that up? And why would you choose rather to suffer than to enjoy? Well, because of his value system. He considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. And why? Because he looked to the reward. Now think about this. He wasn't going to be quote unquote rewarded physically for going back to his own people. He wasn't going to become a wealthy man. He was going to suffer reproach. He looked to the reward that can only be the eternal reward. Remember earlier in Hebrews 11, without faith it is impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that He is and that He is rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Moses put himself in God's hands. And he says, wherever it leads me, even if it leads me in reproach, I consider that greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. Remember Hebrews 11 and verse 16? They desire a better country that is in heavenly. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God and he's prepared a city for them. Think about that reward Moses did. He's thinking about that heavenly reward. He considered it. And the reproaches of Christ greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. Once again, that struck me. I know two weeks ago we were studying about Moses, and I'm contemplating Bible treasures, things of eternal value. And when I was reminded of that, I thought, we have to look at this. This challenges every one of our value systems. Again, do you tonight consider the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the riches in America? Greater riches than all the riches that, that Egypt had to offer. The reproach of Christ. Now, a definition of reproach. To suffer scorn, rebuke, or shame. This is what Moses says, I consider this greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt. Suffering scorn, rebuke, shame with the people of God, also a severe expression of censure or blame. 
Those are the definitions. Now, think about this. Notice some of the things that reproach is coupled with in the scriptures. In Psalm 71 and verse 13, it speaks of reproach and dishonor. Those are really synonyms in a sense. Reproach and dishonor. In Psalm 119 and verse 22, reproach and contempt. And so he suffered contempt, dishonor. And in so doing, he said, this is greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. Again, Proverbs 19 and verse 26, it talks about shame and reproach. In Proverbs 22 and verse 10, strife and reproach. And so this is what Moses considered greater, greater riches, the reproach of Christ. Now, different thoughts, various meanings regarding what the reproach of Christ is. Some says, some say Moses was willing to bear the reproaches associated with his belief that the Messiah would come. Now I'm convinced when you read the Bible that Moses believed that. Moses talked about in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15 that God would raise up a prophet like unto him and that you were to hear him. Well, remember at the transfiguration scene when Moses is there with Elijah? That's exactly what God says. This, meaning Jesus, is my beloved son. Hear ye him. He's endorsing what Moses said years before. That this is the prophet that God raised up like unto Moses. And this is the prophet that we're to hear. Not Moses, not Elijah but Jesus Christ. Again, someone else said Moses endured such, uh, such reproaches as Christ suffered. And we know that certainly Jesus suffered reproaches. You know, you can apply this to any one that lived for the Lord. Old Testament, New Testament. God's people have always suffered reproach. Again, think about this. Thus, the general idea is that Moses would be reproached for the course which he chose to pursue. He's not going to be applauded. He's not going to be rewarded with physical riches. He's going to suffer reproach. There's going to be dishonor. There's going to be shame. There's going to be strife. And so, again, that's the emphasis, the general idea is that the decision that Moses made, the course of his life to give up the Pharaoh, the throne of Egypt, that course to go suffer with God's people, it was going to lead him into reproach, thus referred to as the reproach of Christ. Here's what Vincent said. The phrase is applied to Moses as enduring at the hands of the Egyptians and the rebellious Israelites the reproaches which any faithful servant of God will endure and which was endured in notable way by Christ. Jesus, as we know, he suffered reproach. The reproaches of Christ. Now listen to this. Listen to this because remember, this is the contrast that Hebrews 11 sets forth. That Moses considered the reproaches of Christ greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. So we're talking about the reproach of Christ. Again, not Christ himself. If the verse would have said that Moses considered Christ greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt, we could all readily agree with that. We would acknowledge that without any problem. But it's not Christ himself. It's the reproach of Christ. Again, it's not the riches of Christ. Remember in Ephesians 3 and verse 8, Paul speaks of the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, if Moses would have said, I consider the riches of Christ greater than all the treasures of Egypt, once again, we'd have no problem with that. Exactly right, Moses. Christ is greater than all those riches. His riches are greater than all those riches. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the lowest end that we can go with Christ. The worst thing that we could ever endure with Jesus. 
Moses says, whatever that is that I'm going to do for my Lord, I consider that greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. Again, we're not talking about the glory of Christ. We beheld His glory, John says, full of grace, full of truth. Well, John 1 and verse 14, we're not talking about the glory of Christ. There's no comparison. The glory of Christ, yes, it is greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. But we're not talking about His glory. We're not talking about the blessings of Christ. If you're talking about His blessings, they don't compare with the treasures of Egypt. Again, if you're talking about the grace of Christ, remember 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He were rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might become rich. We're not talking about the grace of Christ. All the treasures in Egypt could not compare with any of these things. His grace, His blessings, His glory, His riches with Himself, His person. But Moses says, I consider the reproach of Christ, the reproach of Christ, greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. That's a statement. That's a mature statement. That's in essence saying you pick out the very least, the worst that Christ has to offer, and it's better than everything that Egypt would offer me. Look at this. We're not going to read all of these, but if you're taking notes, I would encourage you to write down some of these verses. They are speaking concerning reproach or reproaches. Turn with me, though, to Hebrews. I do want us to read some in Hebrews 10, uh, Hebrews 13. Look at Hebrews 10, verses 32 through 35, because this has been brought up before we get to the 11th chapter. We read about the reproach that God's people had to endure. Look what it says. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 32, beginning there. It says, <clears throat> excuse me, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured great struggle with suffering. Now, listen to that language. What they endure? Great suffering. And a great struggle with suffering. Look at the next verse. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you, have had, for you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. Well, you see, he's really talking about the same language when he refers to Moses as he does here. They, again, considered these reproaches the greatest thing that they could ever experience. Again, even though they were suffering, even though there were problems, they joyfully received the seizure of their property. Why? They knew they had a greater reward. That's what Moses did. He chose to suffer rather than to enjoy. Why? Because he was looking for the reward. Look also in Hebrews chapter 13. Consider what he says here in verses 12 and 13. Look what it says. It says, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. He's talked about that in chapter 10. He's given us an example from the Old Testament, even Moses. Now he challenges them. Jesus suffered outside the camp, outside the city. Therefore, let's go out with him. And once again, as he says in verse 13, bearing his reproach. Again, these other verses, they all speak concerning the reproach. Most of them concerning Christ. Turn to one more. 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4, look what it says. Peter has the same concept that the Hebrew writer has that Moses 
has. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through verse 14. It says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is going to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. That's Moses' concept. If I'm reproached because I'm doing God's will, if I am reproached because I'm following the sufferings that my Lord will one day encounter, then I'm blessed. Oh, how we need to remember that. In Isaiah 51 and verse 7, let me just read the latter part of this verse. Because when we grow up, each and every one of us spiritually, we'll all be able to say the same thing Moses said. That I consider the reproach of Christ greater riches than you can find in Egypt. The reproach. Isaiah 51 and verse 7. Look what it says at the end of this verse. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insult. We don't have to fear the reproach of men. We don't have to be afraid of their insults. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a given. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. Look also, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 4. Look what Paul says. Find this very, very interesting because once again, Moses is not alone in his value system. Paul had that same value system. He viewed what was truly valuable, what was God's treasures. He knew that they were worth everything, much more than this world has to offer. Look at 1 Timothy 4 and verse 10. It says, For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. So again, to this end, we labor and suffer reproach. Why? Because we believe in God. One last verse, that one in 2 Corinthians 2. Look what Paul says here. I mean, 2 Corinthians 12. Look what it says here. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10. Read this with me. Paul says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Paul says, I take pleasure in these reproaches because I'm being reproached, he says, for Christ's sake. Now here's the bottom line. Look at this. Think about this with me. The worst day in Christ is better than the best day in the world. That's what Moses was viewing. He was viewing two extremes. Here's the worst thing that could happen to me based upon my decision. I'm going to have to suffer reproaches. That's the worst thing. He says that right there, the very worst, that's better than the best that could happen in Egypt. It's better than all the treasures of Egypt. The worst day in Christ, my friend, is better than the best day in the world. If our value system is what it ought to be, if our maturity level is where it should be, if we are spiritually minded as Christ has taught us to be, we can say that right there. The absolute worst day that you'll ever encounter in Christ, it is better, it is far better than the greatest day, the best day you'll ever have in the world. Think about this. Psalm 84 and verse 10. David says, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in tents of wickedness. What's he saying? I would rather just have the lowliest position in heaven I would rather be a doorkeeper there. If I can just get in, that's good enough for me, a doorkeeper, than to dwell in tents of wickedness.
again. That's Moses' attitude. That should be my attitude. And so the worst day in Christ is better than the best day in the world. Think about this. Suffering for Jesus is better than relaxing with Satan. Oh, the world doesn't believe this. But even if we're suffering for the cause of Christ, we are blessed. If we have to endure reproaches, so be it. That is greater than all the riches we could ever assemble in this world. And notice this last point here. It's better to die in Christ than to live in sin. If we have to choose between life remaining alive and being faithful to Christ, let's make the wise choice. And the wise choice is remaining faithful. It's not grabbing hold of this life and holding on to it at all cost. Paul said he did not love his life even to death. Acts 20 and verse 24. You remember in Revelation 12 and verse 11, they overcame him. Now the him in Revelation 12 is Satan. But the saints in the first century, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and because they did not love their life unto death. When they were given the choice, you either renounce Christ or you're going to die. They said, that's no choice at all. We'll, we'll choose death because we're going to remain faithful. Why? The worst day in Christ is better than the best day in the world. They knew that. It is better to suffer the reproach of Christ than to have all the treasures of Egypt. Bible treasures, this is one, like I said, that confronts and challenges us. Let's make sure that we not only understand this, but that we believe this, and that we live our lives based upon this depth of principle, character, that yes, we're going to remain steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Whatever you do in Christ, it's not in vain. Whatever you do, and I don't care what it is, whatever you do outside of Christ, that is in vain. On the day of judgment, we're going to see just how vain much activity has been. Bible treasures, yes, your soul. Yes, the kingdom, the church, marriage, the family, the word of God, buried talents, their treasures, Let's not leave them buried under the surface. Let's use them. And the reproach of Christ, yes. For the spiritually minded, greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. Tonight, maybe you've examined yourself, your concept, and you've said, you know, that hasn't been my concept. Maybe you need to repent of that publicly if it's affected your public life in Christ. Maybe it's something private. You can go home and pray God the thought of your heart has, you know, to be forgiven you. But whatever it is, let's make sure that we believe God, we believe what His Word teaches. We're trying to conform our lives to His image, the image of Christ, Romans 8 and verse 29. Not to this old wicked world, Romans 12 and verse 2. You need to put on Christ tonight. Believing His Word, the Gospel. If you're ready to repent of your sins, to confess Him, be baptized into Him. Let's take care of that tonight, right now, while we stand as we sing.